Happy Wednesday. I know we are mid-playoffs in the WNBA, but college basketball is coming fast and furious. Coquise Washington of Rutgers is here to talk about it. Lockdown Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Well, hi and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Magdal. Reminding you, you can follow us at thenexthoops.com, where we have over 100 reported pieces on women's basketball every single month. Just an incredible staff over there. Make sure you subscribe there and make sure you are listening to us, making us your first listen every day here at Locked On Women's Basketball. You can subscribe wherever you get podcasts, YouTube as well. We are talking about the game always. And yes, we are deep into the WNBA playoffs, but we are also deep into our preparation for the college basketball season. And coach, I, I just to start off up top, I am a Jersey kid my entire life. I'm about 45 minutes from you right now. Uh, but to see you have this opportunity to build and to, in some ways, follow a legend in a similar way to what has happened at Notre Dame, uh, where we saw, you know, Muffet McGraw step aside, of course, Coach Vivian Stringer, uh, someone who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, um, it, you know, has built a program here. Um, but this is an opportunity to build on that. And I'm wondering if you see the parallels, too, and what sort of lessons you've taken from there into the way in which you've built, uh, started the process of building your own program here at Rutgers. Yeah. Well, first, let me just say thanks, Howard, for having me. I'm really excited to to chat with you about records and, and our process and the things we're going through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to start off, you're absolutely right. It was really kind of fortuitous that I was able to join Yale Ivy staff uh, right when she took over as, as a first time head coach, but in particular, in following the footsteps of Coach McGraw, who's you know, a Hall of Fame coach. Um, it's not easy to follow in the, the footsteps of a Hall of Fame coach and a coach who's had so much success. Um, but one of the things that I noticed and, and I saw uh, from, from Yale was her being very mindful about not trying to imitate and be a mini Muffet McGraw. You know, she really embraced doing things her way, uh, doing things that are authentic and genuine to, to her leadership style, her coaching style. Um, and I think that 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 uh, methodology really helped her to grow into um, being comfortable and, and, and being the coach at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that same thing uh, will, will apply here. I, like you, have so much respect for, for Coach Stringer as an assistant coach. And even as a head coach at Penn State, I had the, uh, I don't know if, if it's a wonderful privilege, but I had the chance to coach against her um, over the years and just what she was able to do with her teams, you know, how hard they played. Um, defensively, how just stingy they were. I mean, it was just a battle to score against them night in and night out. So, um, you know, I have, I have a tremendous amount of respect for her. Um, and also Coach Grants, you know, it's like they've had two coaches and both of them are in the Hall of Fame. It's like, oh my God, you know, what, what are we doing here? Um, so what they've been able to do here over the years at Rutgers for me is inspiring, right? It, it is just like, I'm like, man, look at, look at what can happen here. Look at all the things that, you know, that um, being at Rutgers University can provide in terms of the success on the court. So um, much like Neil, I'm going to do it my way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it in ways that are authentic to me. Um, but at the end of the end of the day, we want to have the same, same type of results in terms of conference success and national success that, you know, that both Coach Stringer and Coach Grinch before me had with this program. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine that coaching against the 55 defense is maybe not 
something that you'd feel is a privilege in the moment. <laughs> I appreciate that for sure. But it does, it, it does raise obviously an interesting question when you're kind of building your own way. I actually love the way you put it in your press conference where you said that perhaps Coach Stringer didn't have the baby playing in the park. <laughs> right. Um, right. But, but it's, it's an opportunity to, to build your own in some different ways too, right? And so yeah. there's, there's things like recruiting in the state of New Jersey itself. And obviously when you look at the roster at the moment, there's not a person from the state of New Jersey on the roster at the moment. But right. there's also, and as you well know, this is just a state so rich in talent. Um, you yeah. had, for instance, you know, the Mabrys at your press conference right. um, as right. an example of this. You know, take me through kind of what that initial reach out has been and, you know, how that's been to be able to make those initial connections, you know, with Jersey coaches who are, um, you know, around and, and, you know, potentially have that next generation of Garden State talent here for you. It's been great, you know, the reception that our staff has has received so far from the coaches in, in the state of New Jersey has been phenomenal. Um, and, and fortunately, I have such a dynamic staff um, that they know a lot of the coaches in the area. Um, they have relationships with them. And so they're uh, building on those relationships. Um, but but the the excitement around our staff coming here has, has been really high. And, and uh, right now, um, it's not so much about identifying a specific player or this player, that player. It's really about building the relationship so that the coaches in, in the state, they know that we're accessible. They know that we will be out. We'll, we'll be in their gyms. We'll be at their games. Um, and, and we want to keep the best players in state. And, and the other piece of it, it has to be a great fit, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's one thing I've, I've heard, um, you know, Coach Shiano and I, we haven't had a lot of time together, but one of the things that I've, I've seen from him and heard from him a, as well as Coach P uh, Pipe is about getting the right fit for our program. Um, every great, every good player in the state isn't gonna be a, a fit for Rutgers and that's okay. But you want to start off building, we want to start off just building strong relationships across the board so that when we find those kids who are a great fit for the university, who are a great fit for our program, um, that, you know, they're be, they will be excited about, you know, wearing that block R on their chest. And again, you have this, and, and you referenced it, but just this kind of all-star staff. I'd love to yeah. go through, if I could, uh, a couple of ways, right? I'd like to talk okay. about your decision-making process with each and um, kind of the division of labor, how you see them uh, each yeah. working out. And so obviously, you know, to start with Tasha Pointer, who yeah. has, you know, a, a, a rich tradition, you know, a, a fantastic yeah. resume in, in and of herself, but, you know, what was that conversation like and, and where do you see her focused uh, the most? Yeah, so um, I actually, Tasha was the first call I made um, after I officially, um, before the press conference, but when I accepted the position and I knew we were talking about having the having the press conference, Tasha Pointer was actually the first call I made, and I said, Tasha, this is going to be you know announced in you know in another day or so, um, but I'd love for you to join me here because I know like in women's basketball, in a lot of ways, Tasha Pointer is Rutgers women's basketball. Yeah. You know, I mean she was an incredible point guard. I coached against her when she played um, as an assistant coach at Notre Dame. And she was just a bear, you know, and she talked so much trash on the court. I used to tell her that. I was like, Tasha, you talk so much trash. And then you would back it up. Like, that's the bad thing. Um, but, you know, just having somebody who knows what success looks like here, mm -hmm. who was a part of building it up, you know, with Coach Stringer, um, so knows what that looks like, um, came back as a coach. So knows, you know, how to recruit to this place. It's one thing to play at a school. It's another thing to, to coach there and learn how do you, how do you recruit? How do you introduce Rutgers University to certainly everybody in the region, but nationally? And Tasha has so much experience at that. So she was the first person I called and I said, like, you got to come back. Like you, you are uh, Miss, Ru you're the mayor of Rutgers to me, so I'd love to have you come back. And um, thankfully, she she uh, decided to join join me. 
And um, it's been, it's been great. You know, she and I kind of knew each other uh, over the years, just coaching, you kind of guard. So, you know, we still do kind of a, a specialty. So, you know, I want the point guards to be able to be coached by somebody who played the position mm -hmm. and played it at a very high level. And Tasha does that. It's yeah. interesting to me also, just Rutgers has been through the years, such a pipeline of WNBA players. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, quite frankly, uh, underrated when they yeah. arrive in the league, uh, underdrafted, in my opinion, yeah. on a consistent basis, relative. And I, I don't think an opinion enters into it. You see what players who came from this program have been able to do. Was yeah. that an important part, you know, not, not just with Tasha, but obviously with Nikki as well uh, and yourself to have WNBA experience as you kind of think through what players are coming through this program? Absolutely. You know, when you want to, if you want to compete, um, and, and we certainly do on the national level, then we've got to be able to get top tier talent and the top tier talent, they, they want to be coached. They want to be challenged and they, they have high level aspirations. So being able to put a staff together that has walked that path, who has done those things, who knows what it takes to compete and on the pro level. And, you know, then, like I said, you know, uh, we're able to get Nikki McCray, who, um, I mean, Nikki and I played together uh, in the WNBA for a couple of years, and that's our history goes back. So I know up close and personal that work ethic, what she has, but to be able to bring um, a, a coach that has the, the level of success that Nikki McCray had as a player, um, that just gives so much credibility to um, our staff and, and kids want to be challenged. Like they want to know how, I mean, she's an all-star. She's a two-time Olympian. She's, um, you know, she's, she's won national championships as a player. She's won national championships as a coach. So she, she knows what she's talking about. Right. And those top tier talent players, they want to be coached by players who've had um, success on the highest levels. And when we look at our staff, we're able to, we're able to bring that to the table. I'm a big coaching tree guy. I always love uh -huh. to trace it back. So to see somebody, you know, who played under Pat Summit, somebody who right. coached under Dawn uh, yeah. Staley as well, you know, so, somebody who played under Brian Ackler, frankly, the right. Columbus Quest uh, years yeah. ago, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of kind of lessons that are drawn in here. And again, it, it seems as if you have really embraced that kind of experience uh, right. in terms of the conversations you're having. We should talk about John Hampton too, uh, yes. coming to you, um, you know, coming from Clarkson University, coming from right. uh, the D3 world. It, right. it, it is, was that also part of kind of the way you, you know, to yeah. put on the med scientist hat, you know, came yeah. about getting all the different ingredients to be able to have as many different uh, inputs as possible and what you're trying to build here? Absolutely. So, you know, the, the thinking for me um, after, you know, talking to, talking to Pat Hobbs and saying, yes, I'm going to do this. Yeah. The thinking for me is, was I wanted experience, you know, and experience looks differently in different ways, but, but I wanted experience because this is, this is a, a program that has the, you know, the opportunity to be a nationally elite program. So I wanted experience to be able to go in that direction. Um, John, Nikki, Tasha, and myself all have head coaching experience, right? Mm -hmm. So that adds a level of, um, in terms of hitting the ground running, that we can do some things um, and, and kind of in some ways accelerate the, the learning curve of being at Rutgers, but we kind of know what we want to do. Um, and, and so when I look at John, what he brings to the table in, in terms of that head coaching experience, that calmness, so the teaching part, right? The teaching of great players and being able to take over, say the offense or take over the defense or, you know, th those type of things that, that those experiences, they, they all have. Um, and, and it's just, it's just a great benefit to our players, I think, to be surrounded by coaches that have that much experience. And John um, was, you know, he coached his, his sister, hmm. um, Keisha Hampton, who played at DePaul, was a star at DePaul and played cool. in the WNBA. And he's the one that taught her how to play the game and developed her. So he's another um, person on our staff who has WNBA ties, WNBA connections, knows what it looks like to 
train somebody, teach somebody, grow somebody to becoming a pro. Um, and that experience has just been invaluable for our, our players. I will be sure to alert Jen Hatfield, who is on our show, <laughs> Prince, about siblings, and uh, she will be very interested in that story. So you, you, you'll you see her soon as well, I'm sure. Uh, I, I want to talk about the arc of success, um, and I also want to talk about just some early season tests, which are really interesting on this schedule. Uh, first, I want to talk about our sponsor, betonline.net, your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Now, I am not a betting person, but I'm somebody who believes in equality. And so the fact that betonline.net offers these options for the WNBA is awesome. a very big deal. It, it puts us in a position where there is equal attention, equal opportunity on women's basketball in the same way that there is on men's basketball. So head to the website today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. And so I, I'm going to take it back to the press conference. And uh, one of the media colleagues of mine asked, all right, so when are you making the NCAA tournament? And, and I, I, I appreciated your, your parry and thrust about it to say, well, when do you want to make it? But I also <laughs> think it's, what's interesting to me is that at least in all the programs I've covered through the years, that's like the last indicator. You know, winning yeah. is kind of the last piece where everything has to come together in the same way that uh, safe opens only once all the numbers are put into place there. And yeah. so you're here in, in year one of a program in so many different ways. And I wonder how you are thinking about how do you go about in measurables, measure yeah. success here in year one for you guys? Yeah. I'm glad you you appreciate it. It's, it was so funny at the press conference when he asked that question. I hadn't even met the team yet. So <laughs> it was like, I have no idea. Like, I don't even know the, you know, I don't even know their names yet, let alone tell you how good they're going to be this year. Right. So, uh, so that was, that was, that was fun. Um, but you're right. It is a process, right? And, um, you know, I'm a historian, you know, like I, I, I got my degree in history, my undergrad degree, and I love reading biographies and all that. And so you look at a guy like Rick Pitino, who years and years ago takes over Providence. And I think that year one, like they had a magical turnaround and um, either year one or year two, they were able to, you know, take, uh, take that ragtag team and, you know, have a magical run through the NCAA tournament. Um, and it's a reason you remember that because it doesn't happen often. That's right. It doesn't happen often. Typically, what happens is you have to build your program piece by piece and step by step. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, year one um, is all about building our culture. It's going to be a dramatic shift for not only the players on the team, but the administration. Um, we have a whole new staff, not just the coaching staff, but, you know, our support staff. So it's going to be a whole new shift in terms of how we do things. And that takes time. Yeah. And so this year is really about building our culture, um, building our style of play, which is going to be different than Coach Stringer. Um, you know, we, we, I, we like to score. I like to score. I like high powered, you know, high scoring games, you know, so that pace playing with pace and, and that kind of thing, that's going to that's gonna take, take some time. How much time? I have no idea. And then you have to add on to that the recruiting piece, right? So then you have to get, get the right pieces to the puzzle. So mm -hmm. um, we're not in a rush worrying about how many games we're going to win, how many games we're going to lose. What we're really worried about is establishing culture, building strong relationships with our players, and then teaching, getting better, getting better day by day. Um, you know, as, as in, in, my, in my previous stop as a head coach, that was our focus, was just getting better day by day. And we were able to turn that program around from a bottom feeder to Big Ten champions in, you know, relatively short time. So we're going to do the, the same thing is work on building our culture, recruiting the right players that are going to be a great fit, Mm -hmm. And then just getting better, teaching, growing, teaching, growing, teaching, growing, and the wins will come um, as we do that. You guys were, and, and you got a question ahead of me, actually, about it, routinely top 50 in pace uh, yeah. at Penn State. Is that something 
a measurable in year one where you could feel yeah. like that, you know, regardless of personnel, we can mm -hmm. drill, we can plan for it, that we're able to play fast in that way. Is that a goal of yours? Absolutely. We want to, we want to play with pace. Um, uh, we, we still have to get in the gym um, and see where we are and what are reasonable measurables. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we're not a big believer in, okay, we're going to go to the final four this year. Well, is that realistic given, or we're going to be number one in pace, or we're going to average X amount. Of, like, are those things realistic? So before we start really looking at specific, identifiable, measurable goals, mm -hmm. we have to evaluate. So we're still in our evaluation phase of this team. I think we've over the summer, you know, we, you know, you get, you get some time over the summer. I think we've had about when you, when you talk about um, how many hours you get, you know, we, we've been in the gym maybe 15 hours over the summer total, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not, a, it's like barely a week, you know, of, of practice. So we're still evaluating our team, but there's some things that we're going to do. We're going to play fast. We're going to play up tempo. You know, we're going to look to, um, uh, look to run a lot of motion offense. We're going to, you know, we're not going to be a set play team where we're going to come down and, you know, so um, how quickly our players are able to absorb that, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, but there are some measurables that we can have and, and paste is one of them, you know, uh, when in the shot clock do you shoot? Like mm -hmm. that's a, that's an element of pace that um, that's really important to us is what part of the shot clock are, are you shooting in? Are you getting good shots? Um, what are good shots? What do they look like? So we have some, some things that we're going to measure, um, to tell if we're on track to be the team that we want to be. Um, yeah. and, and that's, that's, that's the key. It's going to be a chance where you get to see the rubber hit the road right away too. I know. <laughs> Just by looking at this schedule, I, I'm, I'm, you know, listen, I, I not know. Not for the faint of heart, is it right? When no, you not at all. You know, Hofstra <laughs> right away. Yeah. on Monday the 7th and then before the week is out you bring Tony Bazella into town as yeah. well uh for that Friday I'll, I'll have to they, bring my father they, down that's just got right. a really they've got a really talented team you know they've got they've got a couple of um a few power power five transfers that are mm -hmm. um really dynamic for them and then they've got a uh you know a really really good point guard and uh what what's the what's the little kid's name lauren parks lane lauren parks lane, yeah. lauren parks lane. Yeah. i mean she is she is phenomenal i mean she, she just wow um yeah. so yeah that first week you know it it it, it doesn't it, it and then it doesn't slow down we go to the bahamas and yeah so. and, you, and and princeton on the 15th of december i mean and you, princeton no, on the 15th yeah at, at worst co-favorites in the ivy so it's going to be yeah. a a fun first couple of months to see it right away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you feeling like by the time we get to Big Ten conference play in the schedule that you're going to have uh, a pretty good sense of what this team is in year one just because of all these early tests? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think we'll know who we are mm -hmm. um, by certainly by conference play. And then and then we'll, you know, we'll be able to um, look and see what adjustments that that we need to make you know, mm. for conference play. Yeah. Um, the cool thing and what I love about our schedule so far is we, we play so many different types of teams. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to get tested in a lot of ways and, and we're going to be able to challenge ourselves in a lot of ways. So then by the time we get into conference play, we'll kind of know like, you know, okay, um, this is, this is kind of what we're good at. You know, mm -hmm. this, this is what we'll have the opportunity, whether that's man zone, man defense or zone defense, whether that's um, what offenses, you know, and, you know, and who are the, who are the kids that are going to be um, consistent, right? Like, like we have such a young team mm -hmm. and that's the other thing. Um, and when I say young, I mean, young in our system, right? Mm -hmm. But even when you look at the eight players that we have on our roster right now, uh, three of them are, are, two of them are incoming freshmen. And three of them are transfers. Mm -hmm. So we've got the majority of our team is new to Rutgers. Yeah. You know, so everything for them is going to be a first time. And, you know, and we're planning on bringing in a couple of, um, a couple of walk-ons, you know, to, to, to get us up to 10 or 11. But then you look and you see, you know, easily 
70 to 80 percent of the team are new to Rutgers. Mm -hmm. So everything, you know, the first road trip, it's new to everybody. The first Big Ten game, new to everybody. Um, So by the time we get to January, mid-January, you know, we'll we'll see the consistency that you need to see to see to have success in conference play. It's it's largely about consistency. Mm-hmm. You know, who's consistent? Who's consistent in scoring? Who's consistent in defending? What you can count on? And so, you know, we'll see how that how that goes over over the non conference portion of our schedule. It is going to be fascinating, and I can't wait uh, to see how it all unfolds. Before I let you go, I just I I, I really think it's important to talk legacy, mm-hmm. um, if I can. Um, and you are somebody who, at the time you were an undergraduate playing, there was literally not a WNBA. Uh, in fact, you went and got uh, your law degree. Um, and I'm curious, actually, just parenthetically, what kind of law would you have wanted to practice? Did you Had you envisioned a life for yourself that yeah. was separate from basketball simply because this was, you know, the ABL was not in existence at that point yet either? Absolutely. I never had any aspiration of being a professional player. Hmm. You know, and even going to college, um, you know, I got a college scholarship and I was thinking I'm going to college and I'll play basketball and that'll be fun. And I wanted to play, but it was more about going to college to get a degree to set me up for life after basketball. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I never had those aspirations. And when I went to law school, um, I actually did get a chance to practice law. Um, I graduated right, graduated from law school right when the ABL and WNBA were starting. Mm-hmm. Um, but my first off season in the WNBA, I practiced law um, at a law firm in New York, really in, in Midtown. And I did labor and employment law mm-hmm. and I absolutely loved it. And um, I always thought that I never, I never thought about imagine being a coach. Like that was the last, like never, I'm not going to be a coach. I wanted to be a lawyer. And um, I started coaching simply because it was while I was playing in the WNBA it matched and meshed with my off season it meshed better with me being a professional basketball player sure and so when coach McGraw said hey do you want to coach I said can I keep playing in the WNBA and she was like oh yeah absolutely and that was why I decided to coach but I never imagined it would be my career you know I was like yeah I'm gonna do this and when I get done playing in the WNBA I'll go back and be a lawyer and life will be fun And, you know, all these years later, now here I am still coaching because, you you know, I fell in love with the impact you can have on young women um, like myself, you know, coming coming in college and, you know, now having the opportunity to play and how do you manage those things and how do you maximize your college career and, um, and so I fell in love with it and, and, and here I am so. You know, it's a, it's an amazing opportunity that that these young women have to grow up knowing that sports and basketball can be their career. Mm-hmm. You know, and, like it's just amazing that they have that opportunity. And, and just to take it that step further, your your collection of talents, right, mm-hmm. made you the ideal person to be the first leader of the WNBPA. And so I, I you know, yeah. I look at it. I look at I tend to think of your career as this series of being at the right moment to be able to build something. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering if you view it in that same way. And if you view the chance to come to Rutgers, like you said, you know, following two hall of famers, you know, at a program that had success from the very start of the NCAA. And even prior to that, uh, you know, in the AIAW, if this is a chance to build that legacy as well. Absolutely. Um, I, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, the right time, the right place happened to be the right age. Right. So, um, you know, when I, when I started playing in the WNBA, I wasn't, uh, you know, a 22 year old kid fresh out of college. You know, I was an older professional. I was, I don't know, 28 or 29 and had graduated from law school and, you know, had these life experiences. So when we decided to organize and, and unionize, um, and I happen to be practicing law in New York City, which is where the NBA, WNBA offices were. So, you know, got to sit across the table from David Stern and Adam Silver and Val Ackerman and, and hash out all of these uh, these issues because we felt like as players, like this league can last. And if we want it to last, we've got to make sure that 
our, our employment circumstances make this our career. And not just a side hustle, not just something, just because it's the, the summer months doesn't mean it's a part-time thing. And that was the whole focus of, of our negotiations was let's make this a professional environment. And so when we get 25, 26, 27 years later and see the league is still standing, you know, we feel really good about those fights that we had early on to, to unionize and, and to make this thing work. And, and in some respects, to set the standard for other sports leagues. So when you look at the women's soccer league, you know, they're following our model. When you look at, you know, the professional softball league that's trying to get off the ground, they're, they're following our model. That's right. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's, that, that says a lot for us. Um, and, and I, I, again, to your last point about coming to Rutgers, you know, so often when new head coaches get a job, they, they don't often get a job like this that has such a tremendous history and legacy of success. You know, Neil Ivey, you know, she's a unicorn in that respect that she gets the Notre Dame job. I feel like in some respects, I'm a unicorn. Like we don't get this job, right? Um, it doesn't happen every day. So I'm, I'm so grateful and so thankful for the opportunity. Um, I'm appreciative of what it means mm -hmm. to be the head coach at Rutgers and um, the opportunity, the impact, um, being in the biggest media market, right? You know, we're, we're right here in New York and New Jersey and um, the success we have is going to reverberate around the country. Um, appreciating those opportunities and understanding what it means. Um, and uh, we'll, we're just going to try to take advantage of it and be the best we can. Well, Coach, I, again, and you set the standard, like you said, with the PA, setting the standard here uh, in the state of New Jersey. Cannot wait to see what's ahead. We could talk all day, but you've got a program to build and I've got a podcast to get out the door. But our listeners are grateful for you taking the time as well. Uh, to our listeners, uh, make sure you tune in again uh, tomorrow. We're going to have Jacqueline LeBlanc, our Connecticut Sunbeat reporter, talking about the WNBA semifinals. We will be here every day. Coach, I'll be seeing you many times down the line. All the best. Thank you for your time. And to our listeners, have a wonderful day. You've been listening to Lockdown Women's Basketball. Lockdown Women's Basketball, your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022, an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. The local team experts of the Locked On Podcast Network, plus a betting angle from Lee Sterling of Locked On Bets, all combining into one Ultimate NFL Preview. Search for Ultimate Pro Preview 22, Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or whenever or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.